Um, so anyways, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Dustin O'Hara. I'm the director of the Internet Studies Center um, here at Western Washington University. Um, this is the first lecture in uh, a new series, um, uh, Internet Studies uh, lecture series uh, that's going to be happening all academic year. Um, it's, it's quite exciting. We have a, a very uh, fascinating sort of interdisciplinary lineup of speakers. Um, the, uh, um, the, the Internet Studies Center is sort of focused on, uh, you know, fostering uh, an interdisciplinary approach to the study and design of digital technologies. So um, I, should also, I should also make a note that this um, lecture is being recorded and it will be published online later. So keep that in mind. Um, so a little bit about our, our speaker today, uh, Warren Sack. Uh, he's a media theorist, software designer, and artist whose work explores the theories design and, and designs of online public space and public discourse. He's a professor of software arts in the film and digital media department at uh, the University of California, Santa Cruz, where he teaches in the digital arts and new, uh, where he teaches digital arts and uh, digital studies. Um, his, uh, his research has, and scholarship has been supported by the Paris Institute for Advanced Study, the American Council of Learned Societies, the Sunlight Foundation, and the National Science Foundation. Uh, Warren received his uh, doctorate from MIT, uh, the Media Lab there, and his undergraduate from Yale College. Um, his talk today is, um, is, is about his book, The Software Arts. It's a really fascinating, fascinating read. Um, I highly recommend um, you get a copy of it. Um, uh, in the book, he presents a, sort of a, an alternative history to, to software. So uh, with that, I will, I'm passing, uh, uh, passing over the floor to, to Warren. Here you go. Thank you so much, Dustin. I uh, looked at the role, the, the lineup of speakers you have, I'm honored to be uh, one of your speakers. Looks like a fantastic lineup this this year. Uh, Dustin didn't say that uh, he and I worked together at UC Santa Cruz years ago. How long has it been, Dustin? Oh yeah, quite a while, like 10 years, <laughs> about, about 10 years ago now. Yeah, it's been about 10 years. What I'm gonna to talk to you about, as Dustin mentioned, is a book I published last year called The Software Arts. And if you don't have a copy of it, um, I don't know I, I don't know whether Western has the IEEE uh, Spectrum or Explore database in its library, but if, if it does, you can download it for free there. So I'm gonna, there are two parts to my talk. Um, Let's see here. First, I provide an overview of my book. And then second, I'm going to expand on one chapter of the book in which I narrate a history of programming languages that starts in studios and workshops of 18th century artists and artisans. So what I have to share with you today is a work of of software studies. About 10 years ago, a group of us under the editorial powers of Matthew Fuller at Goldsmiths in London put together a volume called Software Studies of Lexicon. And now we also have uh, Computational Culture, a journal of software studies, actually the only journal of software studies right now. And there's a book series called, uh, aptly enough, Software Studies at MIT Press, for which uh, Matthew Fuller, Lev Manovich, and Noah Wardrip Fruin, my colleague at UC Santa Cruz, serve as the founding academic editors. Wardrip Fruin's Expressive Processing Digital Fictions, Computer Games, and Software Studies was the inaugural book of the series when it was published in 2009. My book was published in the series last year. The book prior to mine was Annette V's Coding Literacy, How Computer Programming is Changing Writing. 
And the one prior to that was uh, Benjamin Bratton's The Stack on Software and Sovereignty. So the software study sits at the intersection of media studies and science and technology studies. Unlike some work in the adjacent areas, software studies are critical of, but in close dialogue with computer science. These characteristics are clear in what is frequently, if anachronistically invoked as the first work of software studies. Phil Agri published Computation and Human Experience in 1997. Agri's book is in conversation with SDS and philosophy, but it is also a work of computer science. So for those of you who know about the areas of robotics and planning, this Phil's work was very important. So it would be unfair to insist that works in software studies have to be as Agri's was, seminal contributions to both computer science and to science, technology, and media studies. But in my opinion, one of the distinguishing characteristics of software studies is that they read the text of computer science closely and against the grain. And I'll try to perform such a reading in my book. In the software arts, first, I closely read some seminal work of computer science to uncover its ambiguities and contradictions. And second, I historicize it to find alternatives to current thinking that may not may have been lost over time. So my book is a study of computing as a technology of language and an understanding of software and software composition as a language art. The argument is that the foundational ideas and practices of computing come from the arts, specifically from a coupling of the liberal and the mechanical arts. And the claim is that the software arts is a new name for something that's been ongoing for centuries. The pursuit of methods that provide us the means to invent and interrogate statements that can be or already are widely accepted as statements of connection, equivalence, or identity. And the stakes are threefold, pedagogical, industrial, and epistemological. So first, if software is an art, then education needs to change to integrate it into the arts. What do we teach? What do we learn? These are old questions that need to be posed again in a world where basic literacy is not only a matter of Latin, Greek, and English, but also of software. Second, if software can be written in the manner of an artist humanist, the new avenues of software production be done beyond engineering and science may be possible. And third, if software is the new lingua franca, then there are a series of ethical and moral questions that must be pursued in conjunction with this epistemological transformation. What counts as knowledge for whom and at what cost? To quote my colleague at UC Santa Cruz, Donna Haraway. The software arts are the fruit of a coupling of the liberal and mechanical arts. To demonstrate this argument, the approach taken is partly historical by tracing the genealogy of computing back to events before or during the initial professionalization of science and engineering, it becomes clear that computing, like science and engineering both, grew out of the arts. Prior to the so-called scientific revolution of the 17th century, <clears throat> There were no scientists. There were no professional organizations of science. Most studies that we would now identify as scientific were conducted under the name of natural philosophy. And natural philosophers most frequently published their works in Latin, in which the word scientia meant something broader than the modern cognate science, something more like the general term knowledge. The professionalization of engineering occurred even later at that time and before education and inquiry were carried out in the mechanical arts and in the liberal arts. The software arts is also a reading of the texts of computing, code, algorithms, and technical papers that emphasizes continuities between prose and programs. 
Historically, it's possible to, to say that this position was first sketched out in the 17th century in proposals to develop artificial philosophical languages that were used to knit together the liberal arts like logic and grammar and rhetoric, the liberal arts of language and the mechanical arts. Uh, for example, those practiced by artisans in workshops producing pins and stockings, locks, guns, and jewelry. When the writings of the mechanical arts were cookbooks, the descriptions were recipes. And when they were not cookbooks, they were how-to manuals with metaphorical recipes to explain step-by-step -step how things could be made. The languages of literal and metaphorical recipes, these artificial languages, became what we know today as computer programming languages. And the claim is that contemporary artificial languages have shaped and been shaped by the arts and have rearticulated the relationship between the liberal and the mechanical arts. And this liberal and mechanical arts is an assembly that we currently call art, design, the humanities, and technology. Programming languages are the offspring of an effort to describe the mechanical arts in the languages of the liberal arts. Writing software is a practice of writing akin to the activity of novelists, playwrights, screenwriters, speechwriters, essayists, and academics in the arts and the humanities. Consequently, contemporary education, research, industry, and technology development all need to change to better recognize how the arts sit at the center of computing. While my position might strike some as a radical, it is a relatively well represented among some of the most influential experts in computing. So for example, in an interview discussing the first Macintosh, Apple co-founder Steve Jobs said, part of what made the Macintosh great was that the people working on it were musicians, poets and artists and zoologists and historians who also happened to be the best computer scientists in the world. And they brought with them, we all brought to this effort, a very liberal arts attitude. And this really was not the only time Jobs talked about this, uh, the liberal arts as being important to Apple. He said it pretty much at every uh, product launch he was a part of. And Jobs um, is not alone. There are many important computer scientists who have also put the arts and the humanities at the center of computing. For instance, programming language designers are frequently advocates of treating computing as a language art. Educator, designer of the logo programming language and artificial intelligence co-founder Seymour Papert in his book Mindstorms wrote about how at the time of Plato, there was no radical split between philosophy and mathematics and how today we need to reintegrate the humanities and the sciences. Papert's comments give one cause to recall that the traditional liberal arts as studied and practiced in the early modern era of Europe included both the trivium, that is the arts of language, and the quadrivium, the arts of number. And at that time, there was no strict boundary to be drawn between what today we call the arts, the humanities, and the sciences. So with the book, my aim is to help erase these boundaries. And for each chapter of the book, I have a hope for the reader. To begin, if in the first chapter, the introduction, things have worked <clears throat> as I wish, the reader is willing to entertain the possibility that although computing can be seen as a science, for example, in the phrase computer science, and as engineering, for example, software engineering, it can also be seen as an art or a collection of arts, the software arts. Chapter two on translation is offered as a methods chapter. Translation is known to the humanities scholar and to the computer scientist, but each is familiar with very different flavor of translation. The main example discussed in the chapter is a set of texts from the beginning of the theory of computation covering Alan Turing's machines, Alonzo Church's Lambda Calculus, 
and popularizations of the church Turing thesis that claim that there are no limits to what a computer can do. And this popularization is not true. Turing's original publication shows definitively that computers do have limits by reading popularizations of the text of software as a series of translations from the most technical to the most popular. I show how the popular reception of a technical text can result in a fantasy that contradicts the findings of the original publication. And my hope is that the reader will see how to reframe a popularization as a series of translations from the technical literature out into the wilds of popular culture and then back again into the technical literature. The methodology presented is an amendment and extension to actor network theory, also well known in the field of science and technology studies as a sociology of translation. This contribution to actor network theory or ANT for short is the main methodological contribution of the book. In chapter three entitled language, I argue that computers are not information technologies and operations of computing are not the functions of mathematics. To expand upon these assertions, I narrate a history of programming languages that starts in the artisans workshops of 18th century France. I uh, trace a history of the division of labor as it was practiced in these studios and workshops, as it was transcribed by the economist Adam Smith in the first chapter of his book, The Wealth of Nations, as Gaspar Prony revised Smith to organize large scale calculations with human computers for post revolutionary France, and as Charles Babbage devised a machine to embody Pony's methods in his analytical engine. Ada Lovelace, who used the operations of the analytical engine to write the first computer program in 1843, called this a science of operation and contrasted it with mathematical logic. Lovelace wrote, the science of operations is a science of itself and has its own abstract truth and value, just as logic has its own peculiar truth and value independently of the subjects to which we may apply its reasonings and processes. My hope is that through the history of, uh, through this history, the reader will come to understand the huge gap that separates logic and mathematics from computation and the affinity shared between computation and the kinds of work that is accomplished in the arts. I will return to this theme in a few minutes. So in their original form, algorithms, the topic of chapter four, were simply a new way to do arithmetic, which arrived in Europe when merchant, merchant capitalism was a dominant force. With the rise of industrial capitalism, and in today's age of financial, linguistic, and surveillance capitalism, arithmetic has grown, has gone from being economically important to becoming the beating heart of the economy. Concomitant with this rise of arithmetic in commerce and industry was its transformation into a hegemonic, he hegemonic form of knowledge uh, from a circumscribed liberal art, where it was just one of the quadrivium, the arts of number, which also included geometry, astronomy, and music. Originally spurred by the challenges of mathematics, over the course of the 20th century, mathematicians, linguists, logicians, and economists reduced huge swaths of intellectual terrain to arithmetic, to calculation, in a move called arithmetization. Arithmetization presaged what we now call digitization and convergence. And these moves to centralize calculation have been environmental, <clears throat> environmental disasters for many fields, as calamitous for thought as monocrop agriculture has been to the earth's air, water, and soil. So the hope for this chapter is that the reader, by following the history of algorithm from early modern Venice to the computer algorithms of today, will be giving the means to stop marveling at the powers of algorithms and instead begin to think beyond their ideological limits. And to do this, one needs to understand their industrial and intellectual forces that have been applied for well over a century to translate the language arts 
into the liberal art of arithmetic and once understood to reverse these translations. The focus of chapter five is the liberal art of logic. The computer as logic story is often told to emphasize the many contributions of the language art of logic to the development of the computer. And I too retell that story, but include two details that are frequently occluded, specifically materiality and history. So it complicates the computer as logic story. If one admits that computers of today with power supplies, screens and circuits are materially very different than older works of logic printed on paper. And so material details are usually sidelined in the telling of the computer as logic story. Historical specificity is also usually sidelined in the telling of the computer as logic story. Historical specificity um, is also usually marginalized in the common narrative because logic as it is articulated today in technical venues is not very old. First order predicate logic is an invention of the 20th century. Consequently, to narrate how logic begat computers becomes too complicated if one acknowledges that the logic of yesterday was a completely different animal than the logics of today. By examining a history of logic, the material specificity of logic circuits and some of the softer design techniques of logic programming my hope is that the reader will gain insights into how one can take a seemingly unitary, monolithic, tactical topic, logic, and break it down into its many disparate parts. There's no such thing as logic with a capital L, only a multitude of logics, all spelled with lowercase letters. The next chapter, chapter six, is the second of the trivium, rhetoric. Aristotle tells us that the strongest rhetoric is closely tied to logical demonstration. This chapter traces a history of rhetorical demonstration. The history of the demo starts in ancient Greece when definitive demonstration was a matter of deduction as practiced in geometry. Euclid's demonstration or deductive demonstration is displaced by inductive demonstration in the 17th century during the scientific revolution. Inductive demonstration, let's call it Robert Boyle's demonstration was made necessary when arguments began to be based on empirical data and not just derived from statements taken to be obviously true. Today, arguments are made on the basis of so much data, big data, that no one person could possibly read it all, much less observe its collection. So this has necessitated the invention of yet another form of argumentation that I term abductive demonstration, or alternatively, Solmanov's and Kolmogorov's demonstration. So the latest form of rhetorical demonstration is actually a kind of data compression that is otherwise known as machine learning. And my point is concordant with media theorist Jonathan Stern's idea that we should now be concerned with compression rather than with representation. One could say that the founding document of contemporary machine learning was Ray Solmanov's 1960 publication, a preliminary report on a general theory of inductive inference. Employing a theorem in Solmanov's paper, Soviet mathematician Andrei Kolmogorov articulated a theory of complexity. The Kolmogorov measure of complexity or randomness of a collection of data is the length of the shortest computer program that can generate the data as output. So machine learning algorithms are designed to accept a collection of data and then search the space of computer programs to find the shortest one that is applicable. We're meant to believe that big data sets are aptly characterized by the outputs produced by machine learning algorithms, but we have to no way of checking the data. And so I call this abductive demonstration because philosopher Charles Peirce, who first articulated abduction in its contemporary sense, he was also uh, the person who invented the Boolean circuit in this letter to his student in 1886. Charles Peirce um, 
said that abduction is a form of guessing, or we might say abduction is a form of interpretation, a practice well known to the arts and the humanities. The chapter proceeds from older means of making a point to the newest forms of persuasion. And I hope that the reader with, uh, I hope to, to provide the reader with ways to both question and compose software-based arguments. The penultimate chapter is on the third of the three liberal arts of language, specifically grammar. For a long time, grammar was a political project prosecuted as pedagogy in order to homogenize written and spoken language of empires and then later deployed in an analogous manner to consolidate nation states. Grammar was predominantly prescriptive and then in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, grammar was reframed by linguists desiring to describe how language is actually used. So with the linguist and semiotician uh, Ferdinand de Saussure, grammar be became descriptive. And when it did, its locus moved from textbooks into machines, both mechanical and imagined mechanisms of the brain. By mid 20th century, linguistics had joined forces with the mathematical formalism championed by David Hilbert. This resulted in a transformation of linguistics to exclude meaning from its object of study. In the words of Noam Chomsky, quote, the study of meaning the study of meaning and reference and the use of language should be excluded from the field of linguistics. That's Noam Chomsky. So instead, Chomsky and his followers pursue what they call linguistics in the form of meaningless syntactic manipulations using a formalism tantamount to software. After Chomsky, grammar machines had become software and claims were made that software could constitute a theory of language. This represents a huge shift in intellectual culture. When a computer program, a piece of software can be a theory, we've entered what I call the computational episteme. In a computational episteme, software is taken for theoretical insight and meaning is pushed to the margins. And these conditions are very strange and challenging. And I hope the reader will see that one way to make sense of a computational episteme to remake meaning is to act as an artist, to engage in the software arts. So now that you have a general outline of the whole book, I wanna unfold a little more of chapter three on language, where I argue that computers are not information technologies and the operations of computing are not the functions of mathematics. So to expand on these assertions, I narrate a history of programming languages that starts in the artisan's workshops of 18th century France. Interesting, I'm missing some things. Oh well. <laughs> so my hope is that through the history, the reader will come to understand the huge gap that separates logic and mathematics from computation and the affinity shared between computation and the kind of work that is accomplished in the arts. So let's start with what I call work languages and machine languages. And I define work language, language to mean the text and talk employed to describe the processes and products of work. So for instance, we might scrutinize Benjamin Franklin's writings about work like early to bed and early to rise makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise in order to argue that contemporary business practices as inscribed in documents of corporate mission, of legal contracts, legislation, employee manuals, and so forth are still tied to Protestant ethics in a variety of ways. And this of course was sociologist, sociologist Weber's um, famous project from the, from the early 20th century. So each age, each culture, each industry, each economy has one or more work languages. And by examining differences and similarities between these languages, one can interrogate what work is here and now and how it contrasts with work as it is or was there and then. 
central to today's work language, uh, today's work are the almost performative qualities of machine languages, work languages employed in the design and analysis of machines. To adequately describe how a machine works is tantamount to demonstrating the work to be done in very exacting detail. When a machine is designed to replace a human in a work process, the actions performed by the human must be translated into a machine language. The work language of information, excuse me, um, is a language of calculation developed in the 18th century by a network of enlightenment engineers, scientists, philosophers, economists, and mathematicians, including the French mathematician and scientist André-Marie Ampère, Swiss scientist and mathematician Daniel Bernoulli, French engineer and scientist Charles Augustin de Coulomb, German scientist and mathematician Georg Simon Ohm, Italian scientist Alessandro Giuseppe Volta, and Scottish inventor James Watt. So their work language was used to translate the work of men and machines into heat or electrical charge. And thus we have the quantitative measure of the watt, the joule, the coulomb still used today. The French fortifications engineer, Charles Augustin de Coulomb, stated at the beginning of his 1775 treatise, what he took to be the fundamental unit of work. He uses this unit to compare the work of machines and the work of men. Quote, we have just seen that the effect of a machine can always be measured according to a weight multiplied by the height to which it has been raised. And this measure of work, weight multiplied by the height to which it's, it is raised, is still central to contemporary physics and structural engineering. It reduces what might be a set of very complicated movements to a single number labeled with a unit, specifically the unit of foot pounds. So the formalization of this So the formalization of this language is defined in the unit of work named for the following generations, uh, James Prescott Jewell, an English scientist and beer brewer. By the respective eponymous units, the definition of a jewel relates together many of the participants of the networks. I listed one jewel, usually written as J, is a unit of work equal to the expenditure of energy necessary to apply one newton, that is to accelerate one kilogram of mass at the rate of one meter per second squared through a distance of one meter. Alternatively, a joule can be defined as passing an electric current of one ampere, that is one coulomb per second, through a resistance of one ohm for one second, or we can understand a joule to be the heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of water by 0.24 Kelvin, a measure of temperature named after the British physicist and engineer Lord Kelvin. So this definition can be written as an algebraic equation. The equation does far more than Coulomb's sentences of 1775. The equation succinctly relates not just weight and height, but also heat and electricity, mechanics, thermodynamics, and electrodynamics, many of the fluxes and flows investigated independently in the 18th century. So this line of research was continued through the 19th century as thermodynamics with practical application to, among other things, Jules' business of brewing beer, the construction of steam engines, and eventually internal combustion engines. The unit of one joule divided by Kelvin, that is a measure of work or energy divided by temperature, turned out to be pivotal for the development of thermodynamics. J over K is the unit of entropy, the measure of disorder. So who could have foreseen such a direct connection between work and disorder? 
Entropy is a measure of the number of ways in which a system may be arranged. That is, its measurement in a system is proportional to the number of possible states of the system. So in the middle of the 20th century, Claude Shannon created a formal definition of information based on the definition of entropy. And according to Shannon, entropy is equal to the average amount of information contained in a message. This we know today as a basis for information theory and information theory is assumed to be found the foundation of information technology. This definition of information signals its origin in the 18th century problem of measuring how much work a common laborer accomplishes lifting and carrying loads at a construction site. That's what Coulomb was looking at when he made this definition. Now, many students who've taken introductory physics have been struck by the absurdity of this work language that ultimately became the language of information. So let's imagine you are a house builder's apprentice and your name is Sisyphus. In the morning, your duty is to take the builder's toolbox out of the truck and open it up. The builder climbs to the second floor of the house under construction and whenever he calls for a tool, Sisyphus, bring me a hammer. Your job uh, is to get out uh, the toolbox, climb the ladder, give it to him, wait until he finishes the task he needed the hammer for, and then to climb down the ladder again and put the hammer back in the toolbox. Now, according to this definition of work, at the end of the workday, if you've performed your job well and returned all the tools back to the box, you've done no work. You lifted certain weights in the form of tools to certain heights at the top of the ladder, and that constitutes work. But you return those same weights back to the toolbox on the ground, and that constitutes negative work. And therefore, the sum total work completed by you is zero. Poor Sisyphus. So anticipating my conclusions for today, let's look at the plates for Diderot and Diderot's encyclopedia, depicting the work of artisan pin makers. So these were done in the 18th century. So do you see, I ask, do you see men and machines lifting a lot of weight? Well, no, really, right? So even if the work language of physics and information is the right one for describing coal mining and construction sites, it's not the right one for describing the work of the mechanical arts. In fact, it's absurd when employed in the pin makers workshop. So what's the appropriate work language for describing what artists, designers, and artisans do? There's a second work language developed in the 18th century. And curiously, this history starts at the same place with some of the same people as the history of the jewel, the history of the work language of information. However, the second work language is a language of the arts. Unlike the first language, the second does not ultimately collapse into a single number. Rather, this work language can be employed to describe how work is done and not just its effects. The second language anticipates what we know today as computer languages. Its history is referred to within the discipline of computer science but rarely told in full. For example, one of the founders of the field of computer science, Herbert Simon, quipped in 1958 that, quote, physicists and engineers had little to do with the invention of the digital computer. The real inventor was the economist Adam Smith. So what's Simon referring to? Recall that book one, chapter one of Adam Smith's best known work, The Wealth of Nations, is on the division of labor. Smith wrote, quote, the greatest improvements in the productive power of labor and the greater part of the skill, dexterity, and judgment with which it is anywhere directed or applied seem to have been the effects of the division of labor. So clearly then, Herbert Simon is suggesting that we examine how work and the division of labor are at the core of the computer. Central to Adam Smith's discussion on the division of labor is an examination of how pins are made. Smith's description, I want to point out, is in an entirely different kind of language than the first work language I just described. Adam Smith's work language has its beginnings in a set of drawings that I've just shown you, detailing a workshop producing pins 
in a little town in Normandie, L'Aigle, France. So the engineer Jean Rudolf Perronnet made his observations at this site. And let's call his observations anachronistically ethnographic analysis so that we can be reminded of the importance of contemporary human scientists, especially ethnographers' contributions to the design of software and hardware. Trained in civil engineering, mathematics, and mechanics, Perronnet joined the engineering corps of the Pont et Chaussée in 1735, and soon thereafter he was appointed the chief engineer for the district of Alençon and was primarily concerned with the construction and paving of roads. But during the same period, Perronnet studied the workshops of artisans and craftsmen. He wrote two manuscripts on the manufacture of pins by this workshop in the nearby town of L'Aigle. While neither of these manuscripts was immediately published, Perronnet contributed the entry for pin maker et panglier to Diderot and D'Alembert's encyclopedia. Moreover, Perronnet's detailed descriptions of how the craftsmen manufactured the pins, how they used their machines, and how the machines were designed, anticipate the work language and the machine language of the encyclopedia, a collection that incorporated many articles on contemporary methods of craft and production. So the encyclopedia was this multi-volume work in the 18th century where Diderot and D'Alembert and their collaborators went all over France to figure out how things are made. And they wrote these all down in kind of a recipes. So the design historian Antoine Picon discusses the three main terms of this work language of the encyclopedia. Gestures, operations, and processes. Picon says, the common threads that connect the different articles devoted to the arts and crafts are the description of elementary gestures of production how these movements are integrated and thereby define aggregate technical operations, and the logic of chaining together these operations to form processes organized according to a division of labor. The encyclopedia, he writes, repeatedly emphasizes the benefits of the division of labor, gestures, operations, processes. This triad was applied to the description of the fabrication of stockings, pins, or ropes, the extraction of iron ore and its refinement. The notion of operation occupies a central position in this framework. It's a kind of basic semantic unit that underlies the know-how of individuals and the logic of the entire chain of production. From individual movement to process chain, the thread that weaves them together is analogous to the overall aim of Diderot, D'Alembert, and their encyclopedia collaborators namely the integration of all forms of knowledge. So central to the story of the encyclopedia's work language is a set of writings about the division of labor. 19th century analyses of the division of labor quickly moved from physical industrial labor to mental labor, especially the labor of calculation. And after Perronnet, the history continues with Adam Smith's reading of the encyclopedia. Uh, specifically encyclopedia entry for pin making, and the description of how pins were made in this workshop in L'Aigle, Normandie. This production of pins illustrates his opening paragraphs of the division of labor in his book, The Wealth of Nations. And then, just a few years later, in 1791, Gaspard Prony, charged by the French government to produce a set of enormous and detailed logarithmic and trigonometric tables borrowed back from Adam Smith, this image of the division of labor, claiming that he, quote, could manufacture logarithms as easily as one manufactures pins. Prony designed a great number of, um, organized a great number of working class non-mathematicians to perform as a set of computers in order to calculate the tables. But there is, however, a sort of Oedipal perversity in Pony's claim that he was inspired by Smith because Smith's source is obviously Diderot's 
encyclopedia, and yet Perronet, the author of that entry, was not just Pony's professor, mentor, supervisor, and eventual collaborator, but also his predecessor as the first director of the École des Ponts et Chaussées. And Prony succeeded him as director in 1798. This unlikely detour through Scotland, that is through the writings of Adam Smith, this, this, who was Scottish, that connects the genealogy of computing from Perronet de Prony is the source of computer scientist and Nobel Prize winning economist Herbert Smith's quip that Smith was the inventor of the computer. So a few years after Pony's achievement, British mathematician, philosopher, and engineer Charles Babbage noted how Pony's division of labor could be incorporated as a machine. In my preferred terms, Babbage thus translated the work language of the encyclopedia into a machine language. And he achieved this in plan, but not in physical form. His analytical engine was too expensive to build and required parts that exceeded the precision the tool makers of his time could readily make. And nonetheless, even on the drawing board, it became clear that the machine language he forged out of the encyclopedia's work language is from a very different family than logic or mathematics. So the differences appear clearly in Babbage's drawings. Historian Mark Priestley tells us, quote, in the course of this work, Babbage found that the traditional method of using drawings to describe machinery was inadequate. A drawing could only represent the state of a machine at one instant, and so provided little assistance in understanding the sequences of movements involved in a computer mechanism or in working out the appropriate timing of the movements of its interacting parts. So consequently, Babbage was driven to invent a new graphical notation, and we're seeing that here in this slide, uh, for machines that combine textual annotation and the illustration of the structure of the parts of the machines with a novel means to describe the succession of movements that were to take place in the machine. In the terms of the encyclopedia, Babbage had to work out uh, how to describe gestures, operations, and sequences of movements and operations, that is, processes. As Picon pointed out, as the historian of design, Antoine Picon, um, operations were at the semantic foundations of the encyclopedia's work language. And soon after Babbage completed his design, it became clear that operations were central to his machine language too. At a Lovelace, the English mathematician elucidated the differences between the operations of Babbage's machines and functions of arithmetic and calculus, and she argued that Babbage, Babbage's machine would require a new field of research beyond mathematics, a, a field she called a science of operations. And I guess I've given you this quote already. Because of her writings on Babbage's machine, Lovelace is acknowledged to be the first computer programmer, the first software engineer, and for indeed key issues she identifies concerning the rendering and execution of operations are still concerns of contemporary computer science. The first language I described is a language of functions. The second is a language of operations. Research in art and design is an issue of revising and extending operations because art and design is expressed and practiced in a work language of operations and not of mathematical functions. So what's the difference between a function and an operation? Uh, one can see in the Oxford English Dictionary that prior to the German philosopher and mathematician uh, Leibniz, the term function was a very general term, meaning, for example, official duties or the kind of action proper to a person as belonging to a particular class. And this is an expansive term applicable to all kinds of work. But after Leibniz, uh, a new more specialized mathematical definition is introduced. Quote, a variable quantity regarded in its relation to one or more variables in terms of which it may be expressed. This use of Latin functio is due to Leibniz and his associates. And thus the language of work as jewels is part and parcel with the 18th century movement in engineering to recast engineering analysis and design into the language of Leibniz 
and Newton's calculus. Looking to the OED again for the definition of operation, we see that it too was and still is an expansive term applicable to the description of all kinds of work. Definition 1A is the exertion of force or influence, working, activity, a manner of working, the way in which a thing works. Operation contrasts with function. As Antoine Picon emphasizes, quote, one must observe that although quantification and mathematical calculation could be considered as the quintessence of analysis, the analytical method of the encyclopedia could very well remain qualitative. So in other words, the work language of functions is quantitative, the work language of operations can be purely qualitative. So let's rush this history forward to about a century to 1947 when Hermann Goldstein and John von Neumann published Planning and Coding for an Electronic Instrument, a uh, text that we might read today as the first ever computer programming manual. Goldstein and von Neumann were trying to describe coding, that is programming, for a readership that was completely unfamiliar with the notion. And they framed programming as an issue of translating uh, mathematical formulas into the language of the computer. And yet, they were not comfortable describing it as merely translation. They seemed to feel like the rewriting of mathematical formulas into a computer language was much more difficult than translating from one language into another. They wrote, quote, the relation of the coded instruction sequence to the mathematically conceived procedure of numerical solution is not a statical one, that of a translation, but highly dynamical. A coded order stands simply, not simply for its present contents at its present location, but more fully for any succession of passages through it. So in other words, here is yet another difference between these operations and mathematical functions. The operations can change their order, their number, or their kind as an execution of the program proceeds. So an exposition of Goldstein and von Neumann hinges on their development of the then newest graphical means of programming a machine, the flow diagram. And it merits comparison to Babbage's notations and the drawings made of machines for the encyclopedia. Software is still frequently designed in a graphical notation that bears a strong resemblance to Goldstein and von Neumann's flow diagrams. And if we keep the history of the work language of operations in mind, and if we peer closely into the core of the computer, we can look back in time to see a small pin maker's workshop in 18th century Normandy. But the workshop we see in the 20th century diagram is completely empty of people. No one is there. When we compare them to the encyclopedia's engravings, it is the lack of people that is most striking in von Neumann's flow diagrams. Von Neumann's diagrams are pictures of work without workers. They're at the vanishing point of automation where all workers have been ejected from the workshop and replaced by machines. So something of the work language of operations was lost as it was translated through the French centuries from Perronet to Smith to Babbage and then to von Neumann and Goldstein. What was lost in the language was the facility to include people or more specifically, what was lost in translation was an articulation of the interactions between people and machines. So, the question I want to leave you with, and I have more to say about this perhaps in discussion, but uh, the question I wanna leave you with is uh, two questions. How do we put people back into the picture? And how do we rewrite the language of operations to include interactions? Something that I think many people are working on in UX design and interaction design. Uh, but that is non-trivial to think about doing in the design of programming languages. Thank you. Th thanks, Warren. Uh, this was this was great. Um, I I think we we have time for some questions. 
Um, if um, anyone wants to, uh, I, I think you can just turn, uh, you can unmute yourself and turn on your camera uh, or leave your camera off, whatever you prefer, um, at, to, ask, to ask questions. Um, Well, we have a thank you note from Jack. Um, so, I mean, I have a question, which is if about translation. I mean, I find I find the art, the point about translation that you make the distinction between a sort of uh, perfect translation, a lot where nothing is lost, versus the sort of uh, humanities notion of translation, where there's a lot of interpretation things change um, uh, interesting I'm curious though about like how actor network theory um, informs or relates to to this like if you can help help me understand that uh, so I, I think all of us who who speak two languages know that you can't translate without adding stuff in or losing something or changing a meaning, right? I mean, uh, the other language I speak is uh, French, and we even have an English term for what gets lost when we translate from French into English. We call it a je ne sais quoi. <laughs> something gets lost, right? A je ne sais quoi. Um, a, so I, I think that's pretty obvious to all of us who speak two languages. But in computer science, we talk a lot about uh, translation, for example, translating from high level languages to low level languages. We say, well, we're gonna write in a language like C++ and it'll get translated down by the compiler into assembly language, to machine language ultimately. And we assume that whatever we wrote in the code is gonna mean the same thing when it hits the bottom, so to speak. Um, and it, it doesn't really. So, what, um, this is a, a little bit of a parochial um, introduction to what's taken on in a very wider manner by STS scholars, by scholars who are science and technology studies. So what people working in the, um, the area of actor network theory or what is alternatively called as I showed you in that book of seminal essays uh, that overviews the whole area uh, by, edited by Madeleine uh, Acriche and Bruno Latour and Michel Callon. Um, actor network theory is also called the sociology of translation. So why is it called the sociology of translations? Because in repeatedly in science, we have to say, um, we, we, can, we can make use of this vocabulary translation to say, what are the equivalences? What are the identities that people are trying to show? So to give a, an 18th century example, um, you know, it was a big, it was a big notion before La Boissière, what, uh, ab about water. Was water one of the fundamental elements or was water a, a compound of something else, and it was a compound, then what was it a combination of? And those of us who took high school chemistry, we all saw our high school chemistry teacher extract the hydrogen and the oxygen out of water, right? Um, because the, and then the, the demo usually, you, you get to blow up the hydrogen or something dangerous like that. But, um, <laughs> you know, um, there was a whole series of work that got done to first go from, okay, water is not, just a fundamental element is actually a composite of something, two other things that are much more fundamental. And so they had this idea that HO was water. Um, and then it took a whole bunch of more work to find out that no, it's actually uh, two hydrogens for every oxygen in this compound. And that's why we call it H2O, right? But this was a whole set of work that now is completely invisible because that scientific work of translating, um, of asserting and finding this equivalence between uh, water and HTO 
has just been uh, completely integrated into the education system. That's why we see this demonstration from so many high school chemistry teachers. It's also why it sounds really weird to us if someone says, do you want some H2O water? Because they're the same thing, right? I mean, it's, uh, you, you, you don't, you're, you're saying the same thing twice over. That's why advertisers can label their bottles of, of water H2O and nobody uh, thinks twice of it. But that was a huge amount of work to translate from water into H2O. Um, that, well, that, that's, um, I, I, I think I'm, I think, I mean, I think I'm following your point. Um, uh, it's anyways, it's, it's a fa fascinating talk. So, um, I, I don't see anyone else popping up with questions, but, um, oh, getting another Another thank you. Um, so, uh, well, well, rather than questions, maybe people would be willing to just tell me what they're thinking about, what they're working on right now. We're in this such such a weird situation. We're all we're all at home, squirreled away as an opportunity to kind of share a little bit. Uh, I'd be <laughs> delighted to hear what people are doing. Um, yeah. Well. Uh, yeah, I, I think um, personally, I'm sort of juggling like this kind of domestic sphere and work, you know, sort of like that's like having a having a child and and um, managing life and and you know work at the same time. So that's that's kind of been the the biggest the biggest thing what I've been up to, but. Um, uh, this this is uh, and reading your book has been uh, a real pleasure. So I I, I definitely want to encourage uh, everyone to check it out. Very nice. How how old is your boy now? Uh, my daughter. She your daughter. Is, I'm sorry. Uh, I saw her when she was an infant, right? Yeah, yeah. She is. Um, uh, she's about to turn eight now. So. So yeah, she's she's in second grade. Um, do we have metaphorically or, or literally? Uh, well, she's in zoom, zoom second grade. So exactly. it, it's, it's, it's kind of a funny situation now where, you know, there's, we have, you know, you guest lectures, my class, her second grade class, like all via zoom, all like in the same space. It's, it's like this kind of crazy mashup of, of a situation. Um, yeah, my 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 background is a uh, is is a sort of flight of fantasy. I I got to uh, fly over Greenland last uh, year at about right now, right at this this moment, and I got these great pictures. And so I uh, I put this background with the, the the airline, you know, the the jet aircraft engine in the picture there on the on one side of me uh, to imagine that I'm in a different space when I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not doing things like this, but right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a question for you, Warren, or a comment or something. Sure. I'm, I'm um, I, I was curious at the end, you were saying, how do we integrate uh, the uh, people back into the picture, right? Have the people back into the software or computing uh, sphere. And I'm a computer science professor. Um, uh -huh. And I think, you know, uh, I do think sometimes there is this, I, I always feel it when we do things on campus and talk to people about, oh, you're one of those tech people and we're, we do the liberal arts or we do the humanities. And I always feel like I'm a uh, liberal arts guy through and through. Um, and so I always feel like there's a lot more of a connection there, but I always have a hard time <laughs> kind of bridging that to them. I feel like when I try to say, hey, this is what we're doing, uh, over here that is like the humanities and, and so on, um, it kind of, I don't know, maybe falls on deaf ears or I don't know how to communicate it properly. So I don't have an answer to your question how we put people back in the picture, but I would love to think about 
and I, I mean, I always think about more and I'd like your opinion on how do we bridge that gap? And I think things like what Dustin's doing here with talks like this gets us all in the same quote unquote room. Um, and in a normal year, maybe we all would be in the same room. Uh, but uh, yeah, just like how, um, yeah, how, how do we bridge that gap? What's the, what's the right way to do it? Because I definitely tell my students that uh, all the time when we're learning programming that, um, or learning algorithms or whatever, that um, there's a lot of skills that you bring to bear from you know, writing critical essays and things like that when you're analyzing algorithms. And so, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just curious of successes that have been in that space of connecting people. Well, um, I, I just, from, um, from my perspective, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm a digital artist, but I'm also a scholar. I, that's, I've spent the last few years writing this, this book, so I've kind of got different ways of thinking about this. But from a, a scholar perspective, I think it's, it's useful to think about the borrowings, if you will, of computer science from er other areas of design in order to bring the people in. And these are, these are never easy things to do, right? Because, um, well, I would say because Donald Knuth established algorithms at the core of computer science curriculum in the 1960s, an algorithm by definition does not interact with anybody, right? An algorithm has inputs, it has outputs, but that's it and anything else Knuth calls a computational method. It's not an algorithm if it's interact. So anything where you push a button or whatever, we're suddenly out of the core territory of computer science. And so to bring these in, people have borrowed from, uh, for example, well, first of all, the, the theoretical computer science, just to move from a core concept like algorithm to a core concept like interaction um, is really hard. And uh, Robin Milner won the Turing Award lecture for doing that, for moving, let's say, from the lambda calculus to the phi calculus to allow interactions. But really, um, we see, especially in object-oriented programming, a lot of uh, people borrowing from architecture, or especially the architect Christopher Alexander, who uh, taught at UC Berkeley for a long time. He had this notion of patterns and object-oriented programming uh, really took this under their wing and, uh, and worked on trying to extend um, the notion of patterns that comes from architecture into computer science. Now, on the one hand, I, I teach this um, because I think that's one way of getting the people back into computing. On the other hand, there's a real kind of enigmatic uh, missing piece in most of Christopher Alexander's patterns. So uh, here I've just sort of copied like 30 of his patterns, each of which come from, so this is the book that really introduced patterns into object-oriented programming. Um, and this one by, by Richard Gabriel. But um, I, I just took a, a few pictures of um, what Alexander calls a pattern, which is usually a picture and then a, a sort of a little de explanation about how you might reuse this design pattern in architecture. And so some of them are really obviously about people. This one even has a person in the picture. You can see the main entrance section entrance transition but very very few of them have any kind of technology in them that's a weird thing right so on the, the so you you have this complementary problem uh with alexander's vocabulary of interaction where he's not talking about technology and in computer science we want to talk about technology because that's what we're doing um so how what's the interface of the two but this is sort of the one of the um very few patterns that actually has a technology, has a car in it. Um, but if we just start looking through these, um, the other missing piece, tell me what you don't see. You don't see any people, right? 
It's really weird. Oh, here's, here's some people. Um, a lot of his stuff does not have people and it doesn't have technologies in it. And so we are trying, let's say from area of object-oriented programming to take on board a vocabulary that will allow us to put people back in the picture, but we're taking a vocabulary that oftentimes doesn't have the vocab, it doesn't have the people and it doesn't have the technology. So I'll, I'll just leave you with this one here at the sort of close to the end of the book. Look at this. This is his pattern for a kitchen and it doesn't have one stick of technology. <laughs> there's not a toaster. There's not an oven. There's no people. Um, if there were any, if, if you think of any kind of situation where you'd want to think about the interaction of technology, people, and space, it'd be in the kitchen, and yet it's not there, right? So um, this is, uh, I, I wish I had it, I wish I had a quick and easy answer to this, but as I mentioned in the talk, um, you know, uh, most big firms now, IBM, Intel, Google, they, they hire social scientists. Um, they usually hire them to be ethnographers and they go to look and see how people use the technology. And that seems like a good step forward um, to do that. Um, really integrating some of the social sciences into the design work, um, but it's not easy. Yeah, sometimes I think that people get too, uh, like I've taught students functional programming. And sometimes the students that had experience in non-functional programming, declarative programming, have a real hard time with functional programming. And then somebody that's never done functional programming at all, they're a smart person, whatever, but they're never done any programming. And you show them functional programming, it's very natural. And I think part of that is that dichotomy of once we start thinking about things one way, we just keep going down the path. Um, and like these pictures kind of emphasize that too. Like he clearly has some Thing in his mind about what a kitchen should be, but right, he's exactly. not conveying all of that to us through this picture. Um, I mean, maybe he doesn't have an oven in his kitchen, but I somehow <laughs> doubt it. Um, but yeah, that's just an interesting uh, assumption or something that's missing from the from the work. Yeah, yeah. I think I think it's important to to examine our own uh, assumptions about what we're what what we're designing and what the ideal design would be. Right. So I really think that in many ways, Alexander and a lot of his writing about architectural design, in his head, he lives in maybe a 19th century or maybe even a pre-industrial world, right? Where cars and, and uh, things like, you know, something cooking with, with electricity or gas and not fire is, uh, is just beyond the bounds, right? Super fun. I, I've got to go, but thanks again for the talk. Thanks, Dustin, for organizing. Thanks, Perry. Yeah. See you later, Perry. Um, hmm. Yeah. No, this is, it's, it's interesting. The, the, the images that you've shared were great. Yeah. The, the, the old, the, um, the diagrams, the illustrations of the of uh, the workshops are, are, are fascinating too that you, you shared. Um, hmm. there's, a, there's a lot of work on that. Uh, there's this great book um, that's just about where people appear in those diagrams and where they don't appear. Hmm. Hmm. Um, well, yeah, this. This is um, this yeah. This has been great. Um, thanks, Warren. Um, You're think, welcome. Yeah. Uh, if anyone has any other questions, now's the time. I think otherwise we'll probably call it a day. Um, all right. Well, thank you. Thank you all for for coming. This is this is obviously an awkward kind of venue, but I really appreciate it that you've invited me, Dustin, and that you all have come to see what I have to say. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh yeah, it, another comment. Interesting topic. Thanks, Warren. All right. Yeah. All right, well, um, okay, well, 
thanks for uh, thank you for a wonderful talk, and we'll uh, I'll I'll we'll stay in touch. Talk to you soon. Thanks, Dustin. Bye bye. Bye all.